Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Karthik Merleraj. I'm here with Wetzel Sar. We're with Impact Financial Group. We're one of your annual sponsors this year. And uh, we've had the opportunity to meet some of you here in the room today, but we haven't met all of you. So I'm going to talk really briefly about who Impact is, and then I'll introduce Dr. Cox. Um, Impact is an independent, boutique-style wealth management firm. We work with high net worth individuals, small business owners, and our specialty is retirement planning uh, with a holistic approach. Uh, there's really three things that separate us from most other advisors. The first one is our independence. We don't work for a company that makes their own products, so that allows us to go out in the marketplace and really find the best product for our clients, whether it's investment or insurance, despite the company. It's whatever fits our clients' needs. I'd say the second is our teamwork. There's actually eight of us at Impact, bringing a wide, wide array of expertise and knowledge to, this, to the table. So that's really helpful when we have a really complex situation that requires some complex planning. We can really bring in the entire team and make sure we're bringing you the best advice possible. And finally, I'd say it's just our expertise. Uh, you know, with those eight people, there comes a lot of designations. We work very hard to be at the top in our industry in knowledge and experience. Um, I myself has, have a de designation in retirement management analyst from Boston University. I'm working on two more designations. One was a CPA, but even with the other team members in our firm, we've got CPAs, MBAs, CFPs, CHLUs, you name it. So when you work with Impact, you're really getting a team approach with an independent approach that's customized to each individual. Uh, you know, Dr. Cox, we're very thankful to have him here tonight. Dr. Cox has a unique distinction of being the only chief economist for the Federal Reserve System. Um, he's been published worldwide, New York Times, Financial Times, USA Today, CNN. Um, he's also been in the media for CNN and Fox News. They, all, they often ask him to make simple solutions out of complex economic situations. Um, he's also the head of the our SMU O'Neill School of Global Freedom and sorry Global Global Centers of Global Markets and Freedom. Uh, he's also the Chief Economic Advisor to Impact Financial, so we're very happy to have him on board. We first met him in 2012 while he was speaking on the economy, and we felt an immediate connection on his themes on the economy over the last decade and how we need to change how we're prepared for the coming economic times. Um, so his his research on the six economic themes of the coming decade are really, really great, and we're happy to have them here. Thank you, Carthy. Uh, before I get started, there's something you need to know about me. I've seen more Hollywood films than anybody in this room. <laughs> and you can ask me what my favorite ones are later. Okay, uh, I'm going to say any investment advice I have for this, to the very end of my talk, or for these guys and impact. They are also my financial managers. And you might guess, given that I give speeches to financial advisors all over the country, that uh, I have seen the best, and I still have decided to choose these guys because they are the best, and I'm lucky that they are here in town, and they did a, doing a great job for me in many dimensions. I'm a high net worth individual, have a lot of problems that need to be managed, you know, trusts and so on. So. They do it all. They need a lot of money in taxes, too. That's getting increasingly important. All right. I don't want you to think of the financial space being here, investments, and the economy being over here. You hear financial advisors all the time talk as if they are separate. They're not. Nothing happens in the financial world apart from the bigger picture of the economy. And we move from period to period where sometimes market indexes are the place to be. If you're in a technology boom, new things are happening. It could be the railroad, it could be the industrial boom, of finding electricity, I mean discovering electricity and having it spread, it could be the microchip. When you are in a technology boom, you want to be in market indexes to capture that. You probably can't figure out exactly which companies are going to be the dominant ones. You just need to be in. But the market goes flat about every 35 years, where we leave those booms, and in those times, you need to be in something other than market indexes. You need alternatives. During the boom, the great macroeconomic variables are driving things forward, but outside of the boom, 
you need to rely on microeconomic forces of simply an individual and who wants to get up and make a better life, get up every day and make a better life for their family, and will strive to do so, uh, and will bring you a new product, even if it's the Great Depression. In the Great Depression, we got scotch tape, ballpoint pens, nylons, Teflon, movie industry boom, the airline industry boom, and it was because of individuals who went out there and despite the, the generally tough times, pushed a new product through, and that's what you have to look for today, because the drivers for the, for the overall stock market are gone. So let me just turn to my talk to prove this to you. Six economic themes for today. Here's the, the Dow Jones Industrial Average from August of 1982 to October of 2007, 25-year boom. You can see the market go from 772 to 14,280. That is a 1,750% rise in the Dow over this 25-year period. Do you think that we are in a boom today? Here is how far the market has gone up since that time. Now that's only seven and a half years. So to be comparable, I'm going to compound it. If the market were to keep going up the remainder of this quarter century at the same rate it's gone up the first seven and a half years, it would be up 111% in 25 years. Look how they compare. This is not a bull market. It's a very, very lackluster market. And the stock market is a barometer, of course, of the, the general forces that are driving for us forward in the economy. So what is behind the stock market being so flat? Well, anybody here from IIT? Okay. You better not tell me you can't understand this, because it has to do with the tax rate that you pay when you get your earnings. You have to pay 43.4% to the government. Inside this earnings right here are corporate income taxes. That's taken out before, these are after tax, after corporate income tax rate earnings. There's the interest rate. And so if earnings are growing rapidly, if taxes are low, interest rates are low, you have some stock market drivers. Drivers for the stock market, if the market is rational, drivers for the stock market are falling income tax rates, falling corporate income tax rates, strong earnings, um, coming from, you know, just a lot of demand or a, or a boom or technology or something, I'll get into that. Interest rates falling and falling inflation too, and this is because when falling, inflation is falling, people switch kind of from stocks too. Um, they switch out of um, assets like land and commodities and into stocks. Now, with that in mind, let's go back and look at what was happening in the 1982-2007 period see what was driving the market and how that compares to what's happening today. There were six main drivers of that bull market from 1982 to 2007. The first was innovation, historic innovation. The second was globalization, very rapid globalization. The third was falling inflation. The fourth was trust. Credit was abundant. It was big, low perceived risk, perceived risk in the economy. Consumerism was driving things forward, and also government was becoming smaller, taxes were falling, and it was becoming a shrinking part of our lives. Those were the six drivers of the boom. Let's go through them one at a time. Innovation. Well, I'm old enough to remember the technology explosion that happened back then. It was led by the microchip. The microchip was those numerous technology spillovers on the economy. Computers, smart products, software, the internet, computational biology, that's using the computer to build the human genome, the birth of nanotechnology, growth was everywhere and growth was strong. This little bitty micro, you know, 4004 chip gave birth to all these smart products and many more that we now just consume today and it's just a regular part of our lives. These things can't exist apart from the microchip. All these the products and all the jobs they represent, and all the earnings go away without the microchip. Those are the consumer products, but it's also the final approach spacing tool, which lands planes. The entire 3D seismic kind of fracking we have here today is a byproduct of the microchip. Point of sale terminals, robotics in factories, CAT scans, MRIs, you know, we have these uh, scanners, things that for our groceries, ATMs, kiosks, all were born the microchip, and here's the tech sector growing from 0.16 trillion to 1.6 trillion 
in three decades as a result of this economy. As if that wasn't enough, we connected our computers and had the internet and, and further accentuated the boom, made the boom bigger. It was a unique growth period. From 1982 to 2007, average annual GDP growth was 3.5% uh, over this 3.4% over this 25-year time period. It was astounding. We had, in, in a 300 months, from October of 1980, from November 1982 to November 2007, out of 300 months, we had 16 months of recession. That's 5% of the time, as compared to historically norm for 100 years of 40% of the time. It was the biggest boom in, US, in recorded history in the United States. But what about going forward? Well, we're in a technology slowdown today, of course. Something happened to my first line there just disappeared. But um, but there there will continue to be some technology spillovers from the microchip. Yes, they happen. They're they're technology spillovers, but they're not on the order of the computer or the internet. They're here, but they're not really big things. We're basically waiting for the next big thing, and it's going to be something in biotech. It is the biotech move. It's just that that's a big deal that last takes a long time to work through with genomics and pharma pharmacogenomics. It's going to be as big a boom as the chip boom. It's going to be slower and it's going to last longer. Uh, and it's coming, but it's, uh, it's not here yet. We're looking for maybe to the 2020s before the next really big thing comes here. We're on the back side of the Kondratiev wave. Russian economist Nikolai Kondratiev discovered these waves that come around every 60 years associated with the railroad, electricity, the microchip. Back in 1807, it was a steam engine. And they, have, they, they give birth to a whole new economy, a new paradigm, and they carry with them a boom, a tsunami, a big wave, not a little bitty wave, a big wave, dampening all the other business cycles. Uh, and then you get to the back side of it, and you have um, smaller waves, and, but they're you know, still positive, it's just not a huge deal. So the whole idea of some books which were written back here in the 80s, 90s, saying, down 100,000, you know, come on, <laughs> no way. It's, it's not going to happen. We, we can't get to 100. We can't even get above 18,000 and stay there very long. Okay. It's not that easy anymore. One, one big driver, the big driver, technology. And that uh, driver from the, is gone from the stock market. And market risk is much greater. Returns are less. So don't count on this overall macroeconomic index thing that captures the macro forces, the stock market, to be there for you like it was yesterday. You've got to look otherwise to make money. Globalization. Back then, we had 3 billion new capitalist producers come into the economy. The Chinese, the Indians, all part of the former communist bloc nations plus parts of Latin America geared up, uh, adding tremendously to world output. China moved the workers from the farm to the factory. Uh, in 1978, they were produced, the year, the year before they had performed, they were producing 200 room air conditioners. 30 years later, they're producing 109 million room air conditioners. Massive increases in industrial production of mobile phones. Mo even now, motor vehicles. China is the world's largest producer of motor vehicles already. I've never even seen one. Because they're already a big, big industrial nation. India says, I can't compete with that. You give me a computer, I can speak English. Give me, hook me up to the computer and hook me up to the internet, and I'll do the back office work for you. Uh, you know, your coding and so on. But as time has gone on, the stuff that are done over there in Bangalore, Hyderabad, has changed from this side, which is fairly, you might call it formulated intelligence, all the way over to some very sophisticated things like tutoring American students in their bedroom at home every, every night. You can get, tap into tutorvista.com and get an, uh, an Indian, a PhD level Indian mathematician who will teach your kids uh, math in their bedroom every night, $100 a month, tutor, tutor Vista. So that, there's a whole bunch of sophisticated things happening over here now. What's the result of all this? Falling costs for American companies, rising productivity, all helping earnings. And so you see the E part of that equation going up because of that. Going forward there, going forward now we have 3 billion new consumers this time. Now this is the bright spot. I want you to think about this. There's not a lot of bright spots in the current 20, you know, 12 years that I'm going to talk about. But this is definitely one. This is where you get micro and you look beyond the general indexes. Three billion new cons consumers. 
And American companies that tap into this rapidly growing foreign market demand are going to strike a gold mine. China and India are growing middle classes the entire size of the United States. So we see, you know, when, when we stopped capitalism in Japan and Germany following the Second World War, they grew rapidly for a while, but they slowed down. Same thing happened when Korea joined the capitalist club. Now we see China growing at a rapid clip, India less so, but they're all still growing. More income means more consumption. Uh, population comparisons and the labor force comparisons are astounding. Compared to the United States, you know, this is three billion people. We've got we've got three, a tenth of that, about an eighth of it, really, in terms of labor force, with faster growth rates in GDP than the United States. And what that means, and I'm assuming that the United States growth rates are going to decline going forward because it has been. Also, China and India are. In, we know about their exporting a lot more, and some people worry about that. But hey, you don't ever worry about them importing more, do you? They're buying our stuff. And you know there are a lot of imports of U.S. goods and services over to these two uh, mammoth countries. Buying things in 1978, only one product, the washing machine, was owned by more than 10 percent of Chinese households. But with the economic reform, we discovered they want a color TV. They do want a, a washing machine. They also want to live in air-conditioned buildings, and they want a mobile phone. But they got rid of the landline phone, and not many of them had a car. Yet only about seven percent have an automobile. But look at the massive increases in consumption. Those are investment opportunities. If you just stage your investment the right way, is again, this is microeconomic. Look down at the individual alternative opportunities that are there for you. Betting on electronic products first, then on down the line, betting on uh, the automobile. Now, the same thing's happening in India, just less so, so far, because uh, they're not as wealthy yet as China. But you see the same thing coming on. Color TVs, cell phones, um, and, and so on. Okay, so, but out here is that these both could have these products to sell in the United States and elsewhere in the rest of the world, advertised in a lot of Bollywood flicks. Maria and I go watch Shah Khan, is my, I'm a huge fan of Shah Rukh. And then what do I see? I see a Starbucks in the background, I see an Apple, I see Nike check symbol, I see a, a, an iPhone, you see all the products. Get your eyes off of this wire to run it, uh, and you see the product. And Apple so sales are just zooming up on the basis of foreign sales. Uh, Apple's 61% foreign sales today compared to 40% back then, driving its, uh, driving its, um, um, the reason I stopped thinking here, the reason I stopped thinking for a minute, I was reminded of the fact that these guys told me not to sell my Apple stock. <laughs> <laughs> but I thought I knew better, and I sold it, and now I'm just cussing myself. Uh, okay. Anyway, so product placement in Bollywood films is enormous and it's having a big effect because this is a huge market. Look at um, Young Brands. Young Brands, 24% of their sales are their Kentucky Fried Chicken and their, um, their root beer and pizza and stuff were foreign in 1998. Today it's 77%. As a result of it, look what's happened to the Young Brand stock. If this was when the market closed today, it's up 976% uh, over this past 17 years, well, the market's up, you know, 25%. Um, and they expect to have more profits coming from China and more restaurants in China than um, in the United States. Opened up a Taco Bell in India recently. 2,000 people stood in line to get a taco the first day. So tacos are a big hit in India. But it could be something as simple as toothpaste, which the population is now buying with more income. Or it could be, you know, Oral care, not just other kinds of oral care products, cosmetics, skin care, bath and shower products, deodorants, big hit across the world. Or it could be pills. You know, these are easy to supply the rest of the world, marginal cost of selling pills. But I'm telling you about individual stocks now, not market indexes. I'm telling you about a strategy. I'm telling you about thinking. I'm telling you about a plan, which is alternative to the overall indexes. eBay, boom in sales abroad. Texas Instruments sells gets 90% of their revenue from sales abroad. But now 30 companies today now have.